Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm John Ayanian, Director of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, and on behalf of the Institute and the Center for Health Care Outcomes and Policy Research, uh, CHOP, I'd uh, like to welcome you. Uh, my colleague Justin Dimmick, who leads the CHOP group, is away in Australia this week, or otherwise he'd be here to uh, share and welcome you in person. So uh, it's great to have you here, and we're very excited about this session. Uh, a lot of energy uh, uh, around the Institute and the campus and looking forward to our session today. Uh, titled, A Press Release is Not Enough, and we're very happy to welcome uh, Austin Fracht as our uh, guest speaker, along with uh, Adriana McIntyre and Nicholas Bagley, uh, also presenting uh, with, with Austin. Um, and just by way of background, Austin is a health economist and a researcher, and uh, widely known as uh, one of the creators and, and primary authors on The Incidental Economist, a leading health policy blog that many of us follow. And he's also now a regular contributor to the New York Times uh, Upshot uh, uh, website, uh, uh, commenting on policy and economic issues there. Um, his educational background is in physics and engineering, and then a PhD in statistical and applied mathematics. Uh, he worked for four years at a consulting firm on policy evaluations for federal health agencies and then moved on to uh, his current appointment where he's in the healthcare financing and economics group at the Boston VA healthcare system and also has a faculty appointment in the Department of Psychiatry at the Boston University School of Medicine and in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the BU School of Public Health. Uh, he studies issues in U.S. health policy and also comparative effectiveness studies based on observational data. And his uh, out interests outside of health policy and, and health economics include politics, personal finance, playing the trumpet, and family life. So that sounds like a good mix to me. Um, our second speaker is Adriana McIntyre, who we congratulate. She received two Michigan degrees uh, last Saturday, her Master of Public Health and Master of Public Policy from the dual degree program at the School of Public Health and the Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, she also has an undergraduate degree in cognitive science from the University of Michigan, so, so she's true blue all the way. Uh, and after college, she worked in clinical research at Wayne State University before uh, returning to Michigan for graduate school. Uh, she's the managing editor of The Incidental Economist, and before joining uh, The Incidental Economist, she founded Project Millennial as a place for young adults to blog on contemporary health issues and health policy, and she's also contributed to the Bloomberg View and Vox. Uh, and then our third speaker will be our colleague from IHPI, Nicholas Bagley, who's uh, on the faculty in the uh, School of Law here at the University of Michigan where he teaches and writes on administrative law, uh, regulatory theory, and health law. Uh, before joining our law school faculty, he was an attorney in the civil division of the U.S. Department of Justice, where he argued cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals. He also served as a law clerk for Justice uh, John Paul Stevens at the Supreme Court. Uh, his uh, bachelor's degree is in English from Yale, and his JD is from NYU. Uh, before law school, and I think this is maybe uh, what uh, makes him very versatile, he taught eighth grade English at a public school in the South Bronx as part of the Teach for America program. And uh, Nick has won the law school's Hartwright Award for Excellence in Teaching, and he is a frequent contributor to the Incidental Economist. So we have the A team here from the Incidental Economist, and we look forward to hearing from all three of them, starting with Austin. Thanks. Okay, can everyone hear me? All right, before I start, let me ask, uh, how many of you write uh, work for peer-reviewed peer journals, try to publish? Oh, wow, okay, good, good, a lot of you, okay. So I think you'll agree with me that it's often really hard to get people to pay attention to your work. Um, maybe a few of your colleagues read your papers, and, and if you're fortunate, a few of them cite, cite them. Um, but by and large, uh, they, they don't get much attention. And uh, you're not alone, actually. Um, we have a a communication problem uh, in our field, and uh, it's exhibited by this uh, uh, chart from some um, pretty useful work uh, that shows that a really, really tiny sliver of the work that we do is ever reported in the media in any way. Um, that sliver actually appears there bigger than it probably is in, in numerically. It's only 0.04% or one out of 2,500 uh, journal articles in healthcare that ever get reported in the media. And I think that's too low. I think you probably agree with me that that's too low, that there are many, many more articles that deserve more attention than zero. Um, now, I don't want to uh, uh, imply that every article published deserves to be reported on the media. A lot of work in our field is kind of just for us, right? It's methodological. It's about the data. Um, you know as well as I do, some of it isn't maybe that good. 
Um, but, but some of it is quite good, right? And even some very good papers don't get the attention they deserve. Um, now, just for comparison, actually, uh, just so you don't feel too bad, uh, the same uh, paper found that outside of health and medicine, uh, many, many fewer papers than even this get uh, reported in the media. It's about one in uh, 20,000 in science in general. So uh, we're actually doing fairly well. That's probably mostly um, medical studies. They get reported on a lot. So in health services research and health economics, uh, which is where I do my work, um, we're probably much closer to the, to, uh, we're not as good as one in 2,500. So I'm gonna talk to you today about how we might promote our work a little better. Um, uh, not just to journalists, but to policymakers and, uh, and to inform uh, policy more generally, which is what a lot of us are trying to do. Um, so let me uh, convey to you why perhaps our work doesn't get as much attention as it might deserve. And so this is a um, kind of an illustration of the sequence of research as it comes out in journals. So each color here, think of as like another paper, another study coming out in a journal. Uh, and the different colors are, are just like different topics that they're on. So like, I don't know, uh, maybe the gray one at the end is on like Medicare Advantage payment rates, and maybe the yellow one is a Medicaid expansion or something, whatever. And then they just come out in sequence. And the timing with which they come out is pretty random, as many of you know who do this work, right? The, the time from when you conceive of the study and actually complete it could be years. The time to write the manuscript may be months to years. Uh, the time to get it through the um, review process is again months and then to finally come out, uh, it comes out whenever the journal has the space and when they're ready to publish it. And that's going to be uh, pretty random relative to when um, these same issues, so again it's the same colors here, the same issues are debated in the policy debate. Um, so right, th that, that gray one that I said was what, like uh, Medicare Advantage payments rates, um, maybe that came out way down at the early part uh, in the journal. and. Um, Maybe it's light blue and not gray. So here it is in the middle. And so it's, it's discussed maybe at a later time. So this is progression through time. And the yellow is in a different spot and the orange and so forth. So um, things are coming out kind of randomly in, um, in journals, but the policy debate moves on and we discuss different things. And, it's, and when a um, paper comes out in a journal, it's pretty common for a university uh, or, or the journal itself to, to put out a press release. And that's a a perfectly fine thing to do. It's a good time to, to tell journalists in the world, hey, we have something new, you might want to pay attention. But there's another time that we can do that, and that's when the issue is in debate, it's in the public eye, it's being discussed, and that's a really good time to resurrect that research. Um, maybe it was done months ago, maybe years ago, and say, hey, we know something about this. Um, our community of researchers has looked at this, and um, this is what we, we, can, uh, we can say about it. So we have not one opportunity to promote our work, but at least, at least two, or maybe multiple times if the issue comes up again and again and again, uh, as we've seen uh, many issues in health, in health reform. So now is uh, a pop quiz. Um, it's a, there is a natural experiment um, that happened, uh, when was this, um, in January of 2012, and it happened to be the day after the State of the Union address that year. And on that day, uh, after the State of the Union address, address Aaron Carroll, uh, and, uh, my colleague at the Incidental Economist, and I, we wrote a blog post on the Gemma Forum about the State of the Union address and its health policy content, or actually in that year, the lack thereof. It was a little bit disappointing. Um, the same day, and this was random, I didn't know this was going to happen that day, uh, I published a paper with Henry Aaron on Medicare reform in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so this is a nice natural experiment because they came out on the same day. Uh, I promoted them in exactly the same way. I emailed uh, to journalists that they were out. I blogged about them. I tweeted about them. And both my co-authors have the name Aaron in them. So these are like, <laughs> they couldn't be closer, right? This is a perfect natural experiment for the question, um, which got more attention? And this is a pop quiz, so what do you think? You can use what you just learned or quizmanship. It's a social media talk, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the blog post got more attention. The question is why, and the answer is not because this is a social media talk. The answer is because we wrote about the thing that everybody was talking about that day, right? We used the State of the Union address as a vehicle to discuss health care policy and evidence that can be brought to bear about it. Um, Medicare reform is a perfectly fine issue to write about, and that paper did get some attention and subsequently got more when the issue came up. But I'm just saying, this is a nice illustration of 
timing is kind of everything. Um, it wouldn't have mattered if we put out, if the New England Journal of Medicine, actually I'm sure they did, put out some kind of press announcement or press release on um, our perspective. Uh, the fact is every journalist in America wanted to write about the State of the Union address. So that's what got covered. Okay, so for those of you who are thinking about how to get your work promoted uh, or you know, you know, uh, more um, uh, discussed in, in the policy debate and, and maybe informed policy, I think you're often thinking about, you know, we're down here, we're academics, and I don't mean down as like we're lower on the uh, social status or anything, we're just, that's just how it was drawn by my colleague uh, Bill Gardner. Um, we're thinking about getting our ideas way up to the decision makers at the top, right? And that seems pretty daunting. Like, you're thinking, how am I going to get, you know, a senator to pay attention to my paper? Well, the fact is you're not. It's not going to happen. So don't set yourself up for failure. Like, don't think you're going to, you know, get a call from a senator. What you really want to do, what you really want to focus on is just this first level of the ladder. And I'm not going to go through all these levels. But um, if you can get your work noticed by policy intellectuals and journalists who can then, if they talk about it, promote it, uh, write about it, it can kind of go up the chain, then you've done, I think, enough. You've certainly done something. You've certainly done more than most of us do uh, most of the time, which is nothing. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. We're busy, but uh, we could do a little more, I think. Um, if we can just kind of elevate uh, what we do at the right time, uh, we can make a bigger impact. Okay, so uh, how can we do this? Well, of course, I'm going to promote blogging and tweeting and that kind of thing. Um, and here's, a, I have a couple slides that illustrate that this may just work a little bit. So, um, the Freakonomics blog, everyone heard or many of you heard of Freakonomics. It's a pretty big deal, pretty big blog. Uh, lots of people read it, lots of people listen to the podcast, read the books and so forth. Massively bigger than TIE, uh, but it, it does illustrate what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so Freakonomics blogged about a paper, uh, and this is a measure of downloads of that paper by month and you know basically nothing was happening to that paper and then Freakonomics said hey here's this paper and it's relevant to this thing you might be interested in and boom big spike right people start downloading it so you know it works um, here's an illustration of what we've done at the Incidental Economist with Academy Health where Aaron and I blog um, uh, several times a month uh, this is looking at traffic to their blog uh, several years ago over a, a multiple month span. And each of these spikes is pointing to, uh, or is a, um, relevant to a particular post that Aaron and I did. So, um, you know, their traffic was fairly low, but every time we write about something and then promote it <coughs> on our blog and through Twitter, it drives traffic. So whatever we're talking about and everything else on the site at that time is getting a little more attention. Uh, and this is through the use of social media. Um, just as a, um, Point of comparison, uh, in the 108 days represented here, uh, Academy Health blog had 8,000 visits, and during a similar prior period, uh, it got about 1,400 visits. So that's a comparison there. So um, how does this work? So I'm going to give you a couple examples, and I think later Nick's going to give another example, right? Good. Okay. Um, so there's a number of ways to promote uh, research um, that we do. It all starts with the research literature, so it's really important that um, for what I do and what I'm recommending we all do, that we actually start with evidence. We're just not making this stuff up. Um, so there's a research literature, and in this case, this research literature was on contraception's cost-effectiveness. Uh, and so um, I asked Dan Liebman, who's now uh, a medical student at Harvard, but at the time was worth working for Ashish Shah, uh, and on loan from Ashish to TIE as an RA, which was really nice, so thank you Ashish if you watch this um, later. Um, I asked Dan to do uh, a literature review of these papers. So he did a review and um, he wrote it all up in a nice PDF and then I asked him to write a blog post, he was happy to do that. So he wrote a blog post on the Incidental Economist that kind of reviewed the literature. So that already kind of compressed a relatively large amount of work that a journalist is never gonna read um, to something that a journalist might access, although it was still, you know, it was still a bit detailed and maybe a bit much for many journalists. So um, I then compressed it into a, little, into a little bit more and kind of put it, put more policy context around it and wrote it up as a column in the upshot. So that gave it more attention. But again, it referenced Dan Liebman's work 
and that referenced the research literature, and I referenced some of the literature directly. So it's all built off the space. And then um, many people tweeted about it, but Adriana was among them. Uh, so this was a way to point to the work that Dan and I had done, um, and that in turn promoted the work that all of you and others in the community have done. So that's kind of the point here, is to build up from the base of uh, research that we do, but to promote it through the various social media channels. And in, in doing so, or the only way really to do so effectively, is to um, kind of package it in more friendly ways, more accessible ways, uh, to put it in a policy context, and to do it at a time when people are discussing the issue, which is what we did here, particularly in that column. Um, here's another example about uh, pertaining to Penn State's wellness program. So, um, I don't know if you recall, but going back uh, a few years now, uh, yeah, 2013, Penn State had implemented uh, a wellness program that became quite controversial for a number of reasons. Uh, so it was in the news, uh, and Penn State employees were not pleased uh, with the perceived and actual intrusiveness and um, sort of the costs that were kind of shifted to them through this wellness program. Uh, and then my colleagues, Dennis Scanlon and Dennis Shea, wrote a white paper uh, about the research literature pertaining to wellness programs, whether they work, um, whether they promote health, whether they save money, um, and whether they make sense. And it just turns out, co coincidentally, just a little bit before or as this was happening, I was blogging about wellness programs. I didn't know what was going on at Penn State, actually. I started blogging on wellness programs because somebody asked me, hey, what about wellness programs? Do they work? Um, I think this was in response to a tweet. Occasionally, I'll put out a tweet that's, that asks, what should I blog about? Because I, you know, my list of ideas is kind of getting getting short, and I'm sort of worried where am I, what, where's my next idea going to come from? So someone asked me this question, uh, so I started digging into literature, and um, I got an email uh, about that time from Dennis, who had written the white paper. Right? He said, "How are you doing? I don't know if you're aware of what's going on at Penn State. Yada yada. Uh, hey, I wrote this white paper. You might be interested." And it was like perfect timing. He did exactly the right thing. He didn't actually, I don't think he knew I was writing about wellness programs, but it turns out I was, I was really interested. And this made me even more interested because I was kind of getting into this area, but now I had kind of a hook, right? Okay, maybe it wasn't a national story, although it kind of is. Wellness programs are pervasive and many organizations and people are thinking about them. But in particular, it was really happening in a big way at Penn State, right? That's enough. That's enough to really um, elevate or use as a vehicle to elevate elevate the research. So um, I wrote with Aaron uh, this piece for Bloomberg View. Um, I don't think I have it here, but I subsequently also wrote one at the, with him at the Times. Uh, and then it turns out, just a couple days after we wrote that thing at Bloomberg View, uh, Penn State suspended their wellness program. So um, I've been advised that I should take a lot of credit for this, but this is kind of like an underpowered study, right? I don't really believe that I caused Penn State to do this, but um, what we did really didn't hurt, for sure. But really the point is that um, we ended up elevating this issue, uh, the research through an issue um, that was going on at the, right, at the same time. And I really want to emphasize that it all builds up from the research, right? I, I really wouldn't have done this if I didn't have the research base. It all comes from what you and I are doing in, our, in our, my real job and your regular job. Um, and we have to have the research base, and then we have to find opportunities to um, disseminate the work and connect it to what people are actually thinking about. So maybe you're now really inspired. Um, by the way, I've given this talk, or a version of it, many times. I don't think I've heard from a single person. I'm about to really undersell this. I don't know why you invited me. Um, <laughs> I've not heard from a single person who said, I'm so inspired, I'm now blogging and tweeting. So, but maybe one of you is the, is the first one who will be doing that, and I want you to email me and say, I'm the one, I'm the one you inspired to blog and tweet. So you might be thinking, I, yeah, I'm really gonna do it. Um, so what, maybe you're thinking, what, what should I write? So um, if you start a blog or you write on a blog, uh, you should feel a fair amount of freedom to do what you think makes sense. There's a lot of ways you can go. Um, and you should really follow your passion, because you're not going to do it if you're not excited about it. If you're not feeling compelled to write, if it's not like, if it's not keeping you up at night to get these ideas out, it's probably not for you. People ask why I write, and it really isn't to, like I can tell a nice story here, like I'm promoting research and all that. That's true, I am doing that. That's not why I do it. I, I do it because I love it, right? I have to write. 
Um, it's like part of who I am. So uh, you have to be feeling that, but you might feel it in one of these different ways, or you might be wondering which way is right. It's okay. You should you should just do um, what makes sense to you. So you might write whatever you want, because like if it's your own blog, you can do whatever you want. Um, you might write what you're studying, and that can enhance your career because maybe you can get people who are also studying it to pay attention, to give you ideas. Um, you can look around and kind of see what's missing. So you can maybe you'll say, for example, the wellness program issue, maybe something like that. You say, oh, this is being debated. I know something about it. Let me write about it, and then let me send you know a quick email or a quick tweet to some journalists or to some some other folks. To say, hey. You're thinking about this, everyone's thinking about this, I know something about it, here's some research that would be helpful. Um, that's being relevant and becoming the source. Uh, so to do, the, to do that, you have to kind of pay attention to what's being discussed, what's going on, um, and it helps to kind of anticipate what journalists need and other big bloggers need, and I think, Adriana, you're gonna talk a little bit more about that, so I don't have to go into that too much. Um, how am I doing on time, am I good? Okay. Uh, so, Suppose you, you're thinking of doing this, well, what are the pros and cons? Let me talk about some of the good things that could happen. Uh, it could really enhance your career. It has certainly enhanced mine. If you look at my CV over the last five or six years that I've been doing a lot of blogging, I think easily half or more of the entries on it I can trace back to blogging, relationships made through blogging. Um, I've written blog posts that I've then kind of developed toward a paper or used in the background of a paper. Um, the cost shifting paper that I did in Millbank Quarterly, which is my most cited paper, um, that all came from a series of blog posts. And then I was encouraged by Uwe Reinhardt to turn it into a paper, which I did. Um, so there's lots of examples. I know Adriana's been helped tremendously from her starting her blog. Uh, maybe she'll talk about that. Uh, other good things that can happen from writing regularly, uh, you get better at it. Um, it helps you be more concise because you have to be. Uh, I actually think Twitter is a useful discipline for this. People kind of you know, sneer at it because, you know, what can you say in 140 characters? Well, you can actually say a lot in 140 characters. Um, you can say a little more if you put a link to something where that's a little longer, of course. Uh, but to try to, you can convey a thought in 140 characters that has meaning. And uh, it, if, if, you, if you don't believe me, just start looking on Twitter. You'll, you'll see it is possible. Um, you can expand your scope of knowledge. There's, there's nothing like the discipline of writing in public. So you can read a paper. I'm sure many of you read papers. I can read a paper and think, I kind of know what that paper says. I, I got it. Then try to write 1,000 or 500 words about that paper, about why it's meaningful, about what about it is useful or valuable, whether it could be me the methods, it could be the results. You will find that uh, you're going back to the paper to say, oh, I really didn't get, or, or, or I forget how they, or whatever. But you're going to really understand it much better if, if you go through the act, act of trying to write about it. So expand your scope of knowledge in that way, um, and possibly influence if you, if you gather a, a following. And then if you, if you build a network through your blog or through Twitter, you can use it to ask questions. It's a really great resource. Um, I will tweet our blog questions fairly frequently. It's a good way to... Um, kind of test ideas before you, um, you know, like publish them in, in another setting um, or to just find out more. Okay, a, whoops, a couple more slides. Um, okay, so it's not all good, right? Some bad things can happen. It can be time consuming uh, uh, and distracting and it can be addictive, uh, especially if, you know, you're gonna, you might be watching your traffic or um, getting excited when people link to you and so forth, then that can, that can be exciting and addictive. Um, um, if you do it long enough, it'll wear off. And, uh, but nevertheless, you can, you can, it, you can suck you in. Um, so it's something to be uh, a little wary of. Uh, it can be a lot of work, uh, especially if you know, it's hard to do at first. Um, my early blog posts took many hours. Now I can write them in minutes, uh, ten, maybe tens of minutes, depending on them. Um, and the work is not compensated generally. So um, you know, yeah, that's why you have to love it. It's not gonna happen if you don't love it because you're not gonna be paid. Um, and also, you can be misunderstood. Nuance is hard. Uh, it's harder still when you're trying to be brief. Uh, so people can misunderstand what you can say. Um, uh, but in a way, that's okay. You have a chance to come back and revise. Um, I've gone over issues many times uh, where I've, I've said, you know, 
oh, what I said is not quite right. Uh, let me come back and, and revise that. Uh, blogs are informal enough to be able to do that. Okay, finally, what could go wrong? Um, so what you're doing by writing publicly is you're kind of leveraging up your uh, presence, right? Especially if other bloggers link to you and you get traffic and they quote you and so on, um, the leverage builds. So if you say something wrong, um, you're, you, the risk is higher that it's just going to be, uh, ex you're going to be exposed. Um, so you need to be careful. Uh, you might irritate someone with what you say if you don't say things in a polite way or you make a mistake. Uh, I wouldn't actually worry too much about that. Uh, my experience is if you, I mean as long as you're not trying to irritate people. You should worry, you should, you should worry if you're trying to irritate, irritate people. But if you accidentally say something wrong and someone comes at you and then you engage with them in a really positive way in terms of, um, okay, let me hear what you're saying. Let me correct what I've done if I think you, if you think that they're, they're right. Um, and if necessary, you apologize. Um, in my experience, that's happened very rarely, but when it has, and I've responded that way, I've actually made a useful connection. I've turned a negative experience into um, a valuable colleague in a way. Uh, that's happened several times. Um, and uh, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's all in the recovery. It's how you handle it. Um, it's possible your institution might not be supportive. Uh, so you might be doing this nights and weekends. Uh, you might get some looks from colleagues while you're doing that. Well, what you just say, go watch the talk that Austin gave. There's lots of good reasons to do it. Um, and politics is everywhere. So people are going to put you in a box. Um, these days, really, if you talk about health reform, you really can't avoid politics. People are going to conclude you're liberal, you're conservative, you're whatever. Uh, and that's fairly unavoidable. But if it really bothers you, it might not be for you. Um, okay, I have one more slide, and um, it's, it's basically my entire frequently asked questions section. So I asked for questions in advance, and I got a couple. I got three, two of which I think I already covered. So if you asked a question in advance and I didn't cover it, it means you should ask it again when we have a Q&A. But there's one question that people ask all the time. It's their first question, um, and it's this. How much time does it take? Um, this question makes me squirm. I mean, I want to hide behind this podium right now because it's really, really hard to answer. It's sort of like asking um, how long does it take to nourish yourself like with food? So you can answer that so many ways, right? You can calculate your time to eat. You can add meal preparation. You can add shopping for the food. You can add making a living so you can buy the food. Like, where does it stop? It's really hard to tell. So I mean, in a blog post, there's the typing time, there's the thinking time, there's the reading time, there's the talking to colleagues time. Well, there's a lot of overlap with your work maybe anyway, so how do you count that? It's crazy hard. But I'm going to do it anyway, because everybody wants to know the answer to this question, right? Yeah. So I broke it down into three eras. Um, so the first is 2009 to 20, 2011, then 2012, 2014, and now. So I started TIE in 2009, and here I am now. Um, and in the first few years, I was really learning health economics and health services research. You know, I was trained as an engineer. I'd already been on the, sort of on the job for a while, but I didn't really have a very uh, wide breadth of knowledge because I hadn't gone through um, a program. So I was blogging a lot and spending a lot of time understanding the literature. And so I think I was, I'm guessing now, I just, I don't have records. I'm just guessing. It was like 16 hours a week, roughly. And then, um, 2012, 2014, I was starting to get on top of things. And health reform had passed, and yeah, we had implementation, but the really hot policy debates were sort of dying down, or they were coming around again for the 15th time, and we were all sick of it. I was blogging a lot less, about, I'd say, eight hours per week. Um, and then now, um, things have really taken off, both in where I'm writing, but also um, in my own work. Um, and I'm busy, and... Uh, I'm blogging a lot less. Uh, I think I'm putting in four hours a week. On top of that, for, for those reasons I mentioned, but also I got faster over time. So a post, like I said, that might have taken me two to four hours to write five years ago, I can write in half an hour or something like that. And I have a little help for some things. So I have on loan research assistance from Mishi Shah, as I mentioned. That speeds things up, speeds things up a little. Um, so I would expect maybe not these exact numbers to apply 
to you if you do this, um, but some kind of trajectory like that. I don't think most of us who have a full-time job, especially have kids too, can maintain 16 hours a week outside of work you know, for more than maybe a few years um, at most. Um, eight to four I think is doable, uh, especially if you only have two kids. If you have three kids, <laughs> you know, people I know who have three kids, when they have that third kid, I do not see them. I, I just think they're just full out. Those of you in the audience who have three kids, hopefully you're agreeing with me. I only have two, so I can still do this. Um, okay, that does it. Hopefully it was helpful, and uh, I guess we'll hear from Nick next. <laughs> So in terms of thinking about that gap between academics and policy intellectuals and journalists, there's actually a way to think strategically about bridging the gap. Um, and you have to start with some kind of basic questions, and it sounds dumb, but what do journalists do? Well, they report the news, so we expect that. They, they're reporters. Um, and they're trying to help readers understand the news, so they need to understand the news themselves before the, they can communicate it to their readers. They're trying to convey that information concisely because increasingly readers don't want to read long news articles. They're looking for kind of brief, snappy updates on what's happening, what they need to know. Um, the, the too long didn't read takeaway from the story, the TLDR. And really importantly, it's something that I think um, needs to be considered really critically and uh, not necessarily sneered at is uh, the fact that these journalists need to sustain a business model. And in simple terms, clicks equal money. That can be really frustrating. It's led to the proliferation of upworthy style headlines. You won't believe what happened next. And for policy journalism especially, that can be really irritating to read. Um, but the, there's a reason that journalists are doing that. It's not because they love the titles. I can tell you from experience that they hate titling stories. Oftentimes, it's not actually the journalists themselves writing titles, but editors will do it. Um, this is also true. If you've ever written an op-ed, you know that the editors title your story, and you often have almost no control over it. Um, so journalists need to sustain a business model, and you need to be sensitive to that, and sensitive to the fact that um, they need to convey information in a way that sustains that business model. So what do journalists want? They want information that's timely and relevant, and Austin has talked about this a little bit, um, but it's important that it's relevant. So something that comes to mind as an example is um, recently the way that, recently the Wall Street Journal had a story on ED wait times. Um, and the initial story didn't reference the Oregon Medicaid study and the findings from that, but subsequent coverage of the Washington Journal story and some criticisms of it did reference uh, that study because it seemed strange that the original piece didn't reference that research because the research was so relevant. They want readily shareable information. So if you're preparing a white paper that you want to circulate, and you can make a chart, and you can make that chart attractive, you're gonna have much more, like you're gonna have way more luck with journalists because charts are shareable information. It's something that they can drop into a story pretty easily and build a narrative around it. And it's something that um, I'm not necessarily proud to admit, but when I spent the summer basically playing journalist at Vox, the first thing I would do when I got uh, the Health Affairs press release was run through all of the articles, scroll, scroll top to bottom and see if anything jumped out at me visually because that was kind of a starting point for a story. If I had to create the graphic myself or go to our graphics department to have something made, um, that would be more time consuming and I wouldn't be able to get it turned around as quickly. So it's important to think about you know, whether you can package the information yourself in a way that is really accessible and uh, journalist friendly. They want a resource when they have questions. So if you can, um, if it's, if they're aware that you're there and you're willing to answer questions on whatever topic happens to be your topic, uh, they really appreciate that. I have kind of a list of people I go to for different issues when I'm kind of fussing around with an idea and I'm not sure whether I'm on the right track, but I want to verify it with someone. I want somebody to basically check my thought process before I write a story. Um, I have people I go to for that. And it's, I think, easy to become one of those people if you get in touch with a journalist and you share that you're uh, familiar with this particular area of health policy or whatever policy you're working in. Um, and they're looking for anything that saves time because especially in this kind of traffic heavy, traffic dependent environment, uh, there's a lot of pr pressure to produce a lot of content. A lot of that content can be short, but there's pressure to produce quantity 
Um, not, always at, not always sacrificing quality. Sometimes quality gets sacrificed, and that's a problem. Um, but if you can save them time in a way that allows them to not sacrifice quality, they really appreciate that. So here's what journalists don't want. They don't want methods. Um, I can tell you that they will often skip methods sections entirely because they may not be familiar with what constitutes good uh, versus poor methodology. They don't necessarily want too much nuance, so it's important for you to convey, if you're communicating with the journalist, what nuances specifically they should be really sensitive to. Um, and they're probably not interested in whatever you find most interesting, which is probably the methods and the nuance. Um, so you, it's important to be sensitive to that because the end goal is getting research the attention it deserves. It may not be framed quite the way you consider perfect, but it's still better than nothing. They also don't want reams of information, and they don't want all of that information all at once, so that's just something to be sensitive to. Um, researchers are very good at providing all of these things, but it, it's a discipline to kind of uh, temper what you communicate to a journalist and, and tailor it to their needs and their wants. Um, so Twitter is one way to reach out to journalists, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on like how Twitter works, because I feel like a lot of people in this room are probably already on Twitter. But there are lots of people at IHPI who are on Twitter. There's at least 61 because there's a list on Twitter that you can follow. Um, this is what that list looks like if you pull it up. I took this screenshot a few days ago. Um, so lots of journalists are on Twitter, which is why it's a valuable place to be. They might tweet about a story. They might ask questions. And you can be a resource. You can answer their questions. Um, you do have to learn how to answer questions in 140 characters, which isn't necessarily an easy task. But that's, if you want to meet journalists where they are, Twitter is where they are. So that's the value of Twitter. Um, that said, you're not going to love Twitter when you sign up. I can promise you, you are not going to love Twitter when you sign up. I hated Twitter for months. Um, it has its own culture, norms, and etiquette. And you're not going to learn those by reading anything. Like That's just something you kind of learn by being on Twitter for a while and understanding how people interact with each other who, there are social circles. Um, it, it's a culture. It's a culture. It's online. It's a little bit crazy, but it's a culture. Um, if you have no idea how Twitter works, I'm not going to take you to this website, but there's a website called momthisishowtwitterworks.com. And it is the best resource I've ever seen for explaining how to use Twitter. Um, I believe that there is also a resource that Kara has prepared for tips on using Twitter uh, professionally. but. Um, this gets at some of the technicalities of why do people put periods in front of the at in a person's username if they're replying to them? The answer to that is so that other people can see the reply. Um, there are lots of little weird idiosyncrasies about Twitter, and this site kind of explains them in a way that is uh, remarkably not condescending. Um, so one thing that I've heard Twitter, the one way I've heard Twitter characterized is that you have reverse Facebook fatigue. So um, I attended a lunch with uh, Twitter CEO in a couple years ago, my first, first year of grad school. And he described something called Facebook fatigue. And I don't know how many of you are on Facebook or use Facebook regularly, but when Facebook first started, it was this super exciting website. All of your friends were on it. You could message them. You could you know, post pictures of yourselves, be super narcissistic, and it was perfectly acceptable. Um, and nobody judged you for it. And, and after a couple years, that became really, really tiring. But you're kind of a slave to Facebook. You still check it every day like because people are on there. And if something's happening, you might miss out. So um, people check Facebook, but there's a fatigue that sets in. And it's no longer this exciting website that you want to spend time on. Twitter is the opposite. Twitter, you start with Twitter fatigue. It's a chore. It's a pain to learn. Um, and then over time, you start to understand it. And you start to make connections with people. and you start to have these really interesting conversations in 140 characters or less, which sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, and then it, it becomes addictive, like Austin said. It really does. Uh, I'm somebody who has three tabs open at all times. I have you know, my class tabs, like my C tools, my email, and Twitter, uh, tweet deck specifically. But it, it's a tab that is constantly open for me. And it's actually how I get my news and how I communicate with most of my friends now. So, but when you're first learning to do it, it's going to be uh, tricky to kind of figure out the best way to communicate information. So one way to communicate more information than 140 characters can really capture is photos. And you'll find that uh, these tweets get much more traffic, much more uh, interactions 
than standard tweets, uh, just text tweets, and there are statistics to back this up from PR companies, but here's an example from uh, Jonathan Cohn, who was writing a story about premiums after the ACA was passed, and just by attaching a map, the tweet got much more attention than it would have if he hadn't attached a photo. So um, this has 162 retweets. There's a photo, uh, this is Larry Levitt, who is a VP at the Kaiser Family Foundation, I believe. Um, and there was something with uh, the Florida Blue Cross filings, and um, everybody was freaking out about these zeros because there was no rate change, and he was like, actually guys, this is probably just because the data's proprietary. Um, but just because people wouldn't know what he was talking about without a photo, he attached a photo. Um, I did the same thing with a piece of the in an Institute of Medicine report last summer, um, where they came out and said, kind of, you know, there's no evidence of a doctor shortage, we have a maldistribution. Um, but in order to kind of communicate all of the nuance that was packed into their statement, uh, in a way that would fit into the tweet, I just took a screenshot of the report itself. I'd been highlighting it as I was reading it for my own personal purposes. Um, and you know, 36 retweets is not as many as John got, but it's a fair number of retweets for me. Um, and I don't think that that would have happened if I had just linked to the story without providing the nuance in a way that the readers could access without having to scroll through the 200 page report themselves. So this is a way to kind of pack a lot of punch into your tweet. Um, despite having the 140 character limitation. So if you blog, don't just blog on your own work. You should blog on your own work, especially if you wanna promote it, um, and, and you should reblog on it if you find it's newly relevant. Um, but people are gonna pay attention if you seem to have a wider scope than just promoting your own products. Um, think of it as a service or an education. When I started blogging, I actually started blogging for myself. I knew I was starting grad school. I knew I was interested in health policy. I didn't know what part of health policy I was interested in. So I started to blog with a friend, and I told myself if I have to write once a week on a topic, I will only write on the topics I find interesting. And that's how I'll narrow, narrow down what exactly I think is interesting, where I should be working. Um, so I did it as kind of a service to myself. And it snowballed into all of these other things. Um, but I, I don't think it's right to think about writing for the sake of um, being a blogger. That's, that's not a reason to start blogging. Uh, have a higher purpose. Uh, market, market, market. So you want to pay attention to the link economy. Who is linking to who? Um, what kind of work are journalists looking to link to? Um, pay attention to what others, people who you want attention from, uh, are doing and try to anticipate their needs, try to provide the information that they want when they want it. Um, when that Wall Street Journal article came out, I had started tweeting about the Oregon Medicaid study because I thought that somebody should pick it up. Um, and email is a good way to get in touch with journalists, but follow the three sentence rule, which is do not exceed three sentences. Um, journalists get inundated with emails and they get inundated in particular uh, with press releases, and a lot of those go straight to the spam folder. So if you can communicate your point in basically a tweet to the journalist, they'll appreciate it, they'll know whether it's something that they want to follow up on, um, and it, it doesn't feel like a chore to them to figure out if what you're trying to tell them is worthwhile. You must love to write for all of the reasons that Austin talked about. This is time, um, it's probably unpaid, it might still be to paid gigs later, but it's going to take some time. Um, you really have to do this because you love it. Uh, so also matters for blog posts. So get to the point, like really. Um, if I can't tell what a story is going to be about from the first paragraph, I might click off unless I can tell um, that it's really going to be worth my time because various people have told me to read it. Um, this is something that policy school has really beat into us with the executive summary on a policy brief. Um, Make sure your reader knows what you're talking about and knows what your main point is, because you might not keep all of your readers for the full post. At least make sure they take away the main point from your first paragraph or so, um, or even your title. Make it short or break it up. So um, on TIE, we tend not to have many blog posts that go over a thousand words, because they just become this long block of text that nobody wants to read. Uh, so I had a few blog posts a few months ago on um, HHS's re-enrollment procedures for the exchanges. And I had a lot of feelings about their re-enrollment procedures, so I wrote like 1,600 words. 
Uh, I broke it up into two 800 word pieces and I think that that was still too long. I think that the fact that it was 800 words of just text on a screen um, probably drew, drove some readers away just because it, it didn't look engaging, it didn't have snappy charts to go with it. Um, so I think that you know, four to 500 words is a, a good place for a blog post to be. Use charts because again, they will engage readers. Um, if you do have a longer blog post and you can break it up visually, that's really helpful. And be conversational and personal. So uh, one thing that is different, I, I've done the blogging on TIE, I've done the being a journalist with Vox. Um, I really enjoy the tone of being a blogger, being able to say, this is what I think. I may not be 100% correct. Um, I, I can hedge my bets a little bit more in a, in a way that is personal and acknowledging my own limitations. Um, it also just kind of allows you to have a voice in a way that, um, you know, standard journalism may not. So to get started, use Twitter. Um, I, have, I didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about that specifically because I could go on for 20 minutes about just how that works. Um, comment on blogs and engage with blog posts. Increasingly, actual comment sections are going away because they're terrible places that nobody wants to spend time. Um, that's fine. I find that uh, Twitter is a great place to engage with writing generally. A lot of uh, authors will start search, in, uh, search columns on their um, tweet deck as a client for following things on Twitter. So you'll, you can have a column that just shows all of the tweets of people sharing your posts. A lot of journalists do that. Journalists are narcissistic, just like anybody else who's writing on the internet. Um, and they, they do that. And, and they also want to make sure that there isn't some crazy glaring error. So if you want to engage and you put a link to the post there's a chance the author will see it. You can engage with the author directly on Twitter. There's no guarantee that they'll engage back, but a lot of times authors do. Uh, send emails, but follow the three sentence rule, and make yourself useful. Um, one of the most useful things I did in terms of uh, making friends on the internet was helping people find PDFs, because U of M has really great institutional access, like far and away better than other universities. Um, and so journalists or even other academics would be looking for access to a PDF and I could get it in three seconds and send it to them. Um, I actually like made a fair number of friends just being a resource in that way. Um, and then there's the more complex like knowing what you know and offering that information when people need it. Uh, be an evangelist for sources of value. So know where the valuable information is found, uh, share that information and you know, Tell people why you think that they should read something. Not just you should go read this, but you should go read this because. Um, it really goes a long way towards kind of uh, fostering uh, an understanding of why you are who you are on the internet. So some final words. Be active, be relevant, be involved, be a resource, and, be Nick. and be Nick. Three minutes? No. All right, well, I'll keep it really short, uh, or I'll try to. Um, so I'm the, 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 the newbie on the block uh, at TIE. And I fell into it largely because of Adriana, who knew Austin. And uh, Austin had sent me a question that he had about a legal issue, and I've written back, and he published an excerpt from it, and I thought, well, that went well. <laughs> and then um, the Obama administration delayed the employer mandate. And there were headlines about this decision to put off the tax on employers in connection with providing health insurance. And um, a lot of the l news stories sort of led whether, you know, th this raises serious legal questions. Um, and I thought to myself, I can answer that, right? Like I have the resources because of the work I do and because of the things that I read to be able to offer a thoughtful sort of research-based response to this question. Not an ideological response, but a response that could actually persuade someone that, that, hey, there are answers here. And that's how I got sucked into TIE, was by potentially being relevant to an ongoing policy debate in a way that, with my academic writing, I simply can't be. Um, what I want to talk about is a, a way that Austin and I have tried to influence the public debate, just to give you a flavor of what, what this looks like on the ground. Um, so back in early December, I started getting emails from Austin that I would characterize as, as basically his head exploding. Um, he had learned that the research data upon which researchers had depended for decades for Medicare and Medicaid had begun to be scrubbed of substance abuse data, substance use disorder um, claims. 
So anybody who presents with a substance use disorder who seeks out medical services or care, those claims were no longer being provided in these data files. Um, this was, as he rightly pointed out, an enormous problem. Not only would it be impossible in the absence of data to do research on substance use disorders, um, and that's a particular problem because we have this whole you know, opioid epidemic, like we've got serious problems on the ground with substance use disorders, we kind of want to know how to treat it. Um, but the non-random withdrawal of data from Medicare and Medicaid files would also make it impossible to do research on populations that um, were associated with substance use disorders. So think here about hepatitis C or AIDS, right? Your patient population is going to have a, a disproportionate number of substance use disorders. So if data on those patients disappear, you're going to get a biased picture when you try to evaluate policy interventions based on those data, based on those populations. Um, so Austin decided to take to the blogs uh, and to Twitter, and he starts posting. He says, look, I've learned that this data is apparently being withheld from these Medicare and Medicaid files. He started asking about the justifications for it, and he kept bugging me because what he heard was that the reason that this data was being suppressed was because of some regulations that were on the books. So he started bugging me, and, and I decided to start pitching in. Um, brings me to a really important general point about blogging and being a public voice. Um, one of the things that I've learned from blogging, and I, I think I can speak for Austin and Adriana on this too, is that I'm at my best when I play to my strengths. So I can talk about health policy and talk about microeconomics at a cocktail party. I do it fine, right? But I'm not at my best. I'm a lawyer, right? That's what I know. By the same token, Austin can get some purchase on legal questions, but that's not where his strength is. So when we've got a problem that calls on different talents, right? Bring in your colleagues, bring in people that you know. You don't have to do everything yourself. You can build a team of people who actually can bring their institutional talents to bear. Um, that's one of the reasons that IHPI is so valuable here at the university is because we can all pitch in on projects where we can bring our own expertise to bear around the question. Anyway, so I started digging into the question um, and trying to figure out what the legal justification might be. Austin then just kept beating the drum. Right? He gave an update. Whenever we would learn anything, he'd throw it up on the blog. And he did this for two reasons. One, because we were learning stuff and we wanted to keep people who cared about this issue abreast of what we were learning, but also just to keep it alive. Because these things have a kind of momentum. And so to keep it in the public eye, to bring it to somebody's attention who might have missed it the first time around, to emphasize that, yes, this was a serious issue. So he kept beating the drum. Then he said, oh, wait, I know. We learned that ACOs were having problems with these same privacy rules. They weren't able to share information about some of these individual patients who had substance use disorders, which made it really hard to provide coordinated care for these patients. So we thought, hey, maybe we could bring ACOs into the mix, make them part of the network of people who would pressure SAMHSA for a change. So we said, you know, we don't, this isn't our, our issue, right? Austin's worried about the research, but he says, you know, let's, let's broaden the tent. See if we can get other people to start caring about this. Keeps beating the drum on specifics as we learn more and more. This just started to dribble in from researchers who were, by and large, appalled to learn about the data suppression. CMS had made no mention of it publicly. The data files simply showed up in researchers' uh, hard drives scrubbed of this data without ever being told. Um, <clears throat> so. Because of the fit that we were throwing over at TIE, um, I think CMS had to finally pay a little bit of attention. And we've been bothering them in emails, following the three sentence rule, trying to get them to go on record. Um, nobody really wanted to talk to us, but finally they put out a statement about data withholding. And CMS said on December 9th, very shortly after we started beating the drum, it's not our fault. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration made us do it. And we thought, never heard of them. So we started learning a little bit about the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and started chasing down the lead that CMS had given us on what the regulations were that prohibited them from disclosing this data. So I look at the regs and I say, what are you talking about? They prohibit you from disclosing this data. The regs are quite clear. There's a research exception from the disclosure of identifiable substance use data that's useful for researchers. It says, you can disclose this data. So I said, I don't understand 
why SAMHSA apparently thinks that you can't share this information with researchers. I just don't get it. Uh, Austin learns a little bit more about what Medicare data is being suppressed, right? It's two days later. I go back to the regs and I look at them a little bit more closely and I start wondering. I've read them now for five or six times. They're messy, they're complicated, and I start thinking, oh no, I might have misread this. The regulations did have a research exception, but the way it was written in kind of a squirrely way only allowed uh, providers, mental health services providers, to share the information with other research with, with researchers. So this exception that identified that I'd identified in the in the regulations didn't extend to what the regulations called third-party payers. And third-party payers was defined in some other nook of these regulations as including government agencies, which would include Medicare and Medicaid, which meant that I goofed. So I figured it out and I came clean about it. I said, gosh, you know, four days later I said, <laughs> I am now going to eat crow publicly and walk that back. And it's, it was one of those episodes, nobody likes being wrong. Nobody likes being wrong, especially when they've been so declarative. Um, and I learned a little bit from that experience. But I also learned, right, there's a sense in which once I learned I made a mistake, I had an obligation to share why I made the mistake and to show my work. And it's one of the things that I've learned as a blogger is that if you do this long enough, you will make mistakes. That's the point of blogging, is to be relevant, to be quick, to get it out there when people care about the issue. And the fact is, I don't know everything. No one who blogs knows everything, and you're going to make mistakes. So the question isn't, are you going to make mistakes, but how do you deal with them when you make them? Obviously, you'll be as careful as you can, but part of the point of blogging is that you can't cross all your T's and dot all your I's. And indeed, if you were petrified about making a mistake, you'd never actually do it. So I walked it back which was a good idea. Austin keep beating the drum about what the, the value of this data, why this data is important. Um, we finally get a statement from SAMHSA on why it's withholding the data. And it endorses the, um, the, the, you know, the, the analysis that I'd sketched out just a couple of days before. So I'd said, look, like, this is why, what I think they might be thinking. Finally, right, about two weeks after we'd started blogging on this, we get a justification for this massive change in Medicare and Medicaid policy. So SAMHSA points to the regulations and says, you know, we're not happy that CMS has to withhold this data now, but the regulations made us do it. All right, so now we finally have clarity on what the issue is. Now we finally got some kind of response from the federal government, and we start trying to build a strategy to actually get SAMHSA to reconsider its regulations. Because if this is a regulatory problem, not a statutory problem, SAMHSA can rethink it. So we start talking on the phone to Academy Health. We start trying to talk to researchers about what kinds of uh, data has been scrubbed, right? We start having lots of conference calls. Um, and we started building a strategy. We got, uh, opened up a line of communication between Academy Health and researchers. We said, this is the kind of information we need to be effective. Um, Academy Health had more success than we did, leveraging its contacts within the administration to actually talk to people at SAMHSA. SAMHSA was either irritated with us or just didn't want to talk to people that they perceived to be journalists, although blogging is not quite journalism. But nonetheless, we were personas non grata, and so Academy Health was better able to actually talk to people on the ground. We got some slightly better sense of what was going on. Um, and we decided that our job was to try to keep beating the drum. Again, these things have a kind of momentum to them. We had tried very hard to interest journalists in this story and were struggling. Journalists thought this was too niche, um, that perhaps the privacy issues were not gonna resonate with readers who might feel that this data ought not be shared. Um, so we had limited success there, so we had to do this ourselves. So we went to the New England Journal of Medicine and said, okay, what we're gonna try to do is is compile what we've learned and try to use a slightly bigger or different kind of megaphone that we then use to try to interest journalists in getting this problem addressed. So we get this thing out and we then hear about a week later, SAMHSA talks to Politico and says, we're thinking about a rule change. Um, which is great news, so we publish that, right? We say, okay, great, they're thinking about making this a little bit better. But the fact is, it's still a long way from the finish line. They have to still get this thing through the notice and comment process. 
So then Austin went to the New York Times and got it with the biggest megaphone of all and said, look, this is a serious issue. Um, uh, between that time, we also got contacted from people on the, on the Hill, um, Senate staffers who were considering making this a bit of an issue at SAMHSA. Um, whether that will come to anything, I don't know. Um, what I wanted to do by, by showing this to you, um, we're obviously still in the midst of this. And, and we don't know if we're ever going to prove successful. And we don't know if what we did actually has led SAMHSA to reconsider um, their policy. I suspect it played a role. Right? This is the first time this was ever publicly announced, and one gets the feeling that the agencies would have just wished that this passed unnoticed. Um, nonetheless, right, we have felt a little bit like we have, we have been successful along some dimensions, making this a public issue, getting the administration to pay attention. We have struggled to get the research community engaged and enabled around these issues. But what you can see is just how much we had to do Right, to get people to pay attention to this issue, right, you have to keep beating the drum, try to keep momentum up. And right now, again, we don't know if we're going to prove successful at this. We may very well not, especially if we can't get more people interested and more people on board. But you see what you have to do to sort of try to build momentum for an idea. You can't just put a paper out there. It's not going to be enough. Um, that's all I got. We're happy to take questions. So we know it's a few minutes past five, but those of you Sorry. who are still here, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in, in the content and the, the tips that we heard, and so we'd like to open it up for questions, reactions, comments uh, for any and all of our Incidental and Economist A-team. Tim? So you used you alluded to the... Oh, we have a mic for Tim for the recording. You alluded to the comment sections in the right way, but how much of a problem has that been? I mean, every time I look online at the newspaper, I get depressed and stop reading it. And I wonder I'm what it's like being on the, on the target end of, of these kinds of attacks that you get. Yeah, I have, I have a special interest in, in loosely monitoring comment, the disappearance of comment sections. And I have a colleague across the country, Keith Humphreys, he's at Stanford and also in the VA, and he, he's also, he's also um, anti-comment sections. Um, I'll tell you, at TIE, we got rid of comments well, over a year ago, I think. I think it was maybe a year and a half. Um, six months of soul searching? <laughs> yeah, we struggled mightily about that decision. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's nice when you have um, uh, considered useful feedback about what you've done and dialogue among people who have um, knowledge to share. But uh, if you don't moderate, that, you're going to get a lot of spam and trolls and whatnot. So we were sharing the moderation duties at TIE, and it, it, it started to wear on us. Um, I think we have a kind of a daily rotation, or I think Adriana, you took on most of the effort, but um, just weeding through it. And then when you delete a comment or edit it, then you hear from the commenter sometimes, and they chew you out, and that's not fun. Um, so we decided to shut it off, and I, and I haven't regretted the decision. Uh, we can turn on comments on a co post by post basis, um, and and we do sometimes when we want the specific feedback. But actually, comments have really moved to Twitter or other Reddit or other places, and so there's plenty of places for people to, to provide feedback. And if you want to have your soul ripped out and stomped on, you can go there and look for it. Um, I generally don't. Um, usually, what I get from Twitter is just fine, and it's usually pretty good. And I get some by email, and that's good too. And that's enough for me. Um, I'm not even sure if I answered your question. You know what happened? Is you said comment section, and my head exploded. And I'm not <laughs> sure I heard the rest of what you. <laughs> okay. I think Julia had a question in the back. So I thought you guys made a really strong case for doing this if you love it. Um, but you also made a strong case perhaps for doing it if you don't love it. Um, and so I'm curious if you have seen models or approaches that you feel like work for getting more engaged uh, if you don't love it, including you know, trying to find someone who is really good at the blogging side but doesn't have the content side and partnering with them, or just sort of other strategies. 
So I think you can do Twitter without the blogging. It, it's not going to be as fully effective. You're not going to be able to do the, you're not going to be able to have the whole narrative that Nick and Austin had around, you know, getting SAMHSA to make a rule change. But you can still do a lot of the engaging with journalists and getting work out there, I think, on a uh, 140 character level. Uh, and it's really effective because that is really where the journalists are. Um, I think it's useful to have a space for blogging um, to back up what you're saying. You don't necessarily need to use it routinely. I've been blogging much less this past term just because I had so much going on, but um, my Twitter didn't really flag a whole lot. Um, so it, I, I think that it's a balance that you can try to strike depending on where your interests are, what you find personally gratifying, what you find uh, rewarding. Um, so, yeah. um, <clears throat> you'll notice, right, I, I didn't start TIE and I would not be able to devote 16 hours a week to blogging. Um, and, and my contributions to the site are much skinnier than, than Austin's contributions. Um, so I, I would, if you want to take my approach, you can exploit other people to do the hard work for you. Um, and I, I say that somewhat in jest, but it, but it is the case that to do a blog and to do it right, you got to have content, you got to have a lot of it. And that's, if you're not superhuman like Austin and Aaron, um, it takes a big team. Um, there are disadvantages to that, to the brand, and to making people interested in coming back and meeting the same people over and over, but that's a way to get some exposure and cultivating the relationships with people who do have the megaphones. Um, that can be very useful. An email to Austin saying, have you seen this paper, can go some distance. Um, you can't write about every single one of them, but sometimes that helps. Or somebody else you know who has a somewhat bigger megaphone. Other questions? Actually, right. let me just weigh in really quick. Um, I think if, if you think you've got something happening, whether it's yours or your group or something you've heard of, that you think um, <clears throat> deserves attention, bringing in um, a potentially interested blogger or journalist as soon as possible, well before publication, um, is worthwhile. Um, <coughs> I'd say I have some colleagues around the country who, who send me their papers when they're in draft form, um, or they just email me that something's going on. And um, the sooner I can kind of plug in, the, the easier it is. Um, I can't do it every time, but that's something you can proactively do, and um, I appreciate it. And I, I don't know, you think journalists like that? Yeah. As well, well, probably as long as the lead time. For, for most journalists, probably lead time of a, a week is plenty. For me, I mean, yeah, you can give me two months, and I'm happy. I mean, you can bring me in pretty early. So much. Yeah, I, you might have answered this already with your uh, comments on, <coughs> or deleting the comments on your blog. Um, what are the dangers for people on commenting on things that might even be more controversial than CMS scrubbing data uh, from substance use uh, treatment. So for instance, breast cancer screening can be very polarizing. There's been some action on that. Most of us would agree with the recommendations of the uh, Prevention Task Force, but I can see if you blocked about that, you might get a lot of blowback from people. Does that worry you? Does the recent um, discussion around people's lives being ruined by Twitter concern you? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think a lot of this is a question of tone. So um, it's how you address problems and questions. Um, so I've been both critical of the administration and I've endorsed what they've done, and I've done it, and I think what I, what I hope is a respectful and thoughtful tone, still readable. Um, I think that helps a lot. And if you show your work and you're careful and you're not just engaging in political spleen, um, that can, I, I think it can be effective in persuading at least some of your readers. But there are going to be people who think you're a partisan hack if you're writing on anything that touches on political issues. And there's, there's nothing you can do about that. The, the option is to shut up. Um, and that's an approach, right? Uh, especially if you have you know, a desire to get appointed to anything in Washington. But if what you want to do is influence the policy debate, you can't be silent in the face of this. And you just have to make sure that whenever you sit down at the computer, you're not writing mad. You're not out there to score personal points. You're not, you, you, you have to do it in the spirit of, I want to get to the right answer. And if you're doing it for any other reason, I think you are going to get in trouble. Um, but if all you want to do is get to the right answer, and you're not trying to be catty, I think you'll be OK. I haven't gotten in terribly big trouble yet. 
I mean, I do sometimes write mad, but I have somebody else read what I've written, if, <laughs> if I do that, um, usually Austin. I, I would say that showing your work, like Nick said, goes a long, long way in terms of, um, it's not just that you're saying this and you're making these baseless assumptions. You're saying, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we should be paying attention to this. I think that that goes much farther than saying, um, you know, people who want to have screenings annually are wrong. There's a way to approach the topic in a way that feels constructive, even to people who disagree with you. Yeah, the pithy, the pithy way I'd put it is, um, I'm not trying to tell you what to think, but I am telling you the truth. <laughs> it's best I know it anyway. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Carol, I wonder if you could raise your hand and yep. just let folks know about what we have in the back of the room sure. as we lots wrap up. Oh, here's a microphone for you. Oh, thank you. So in the back, uh, we have a lot of handouts uh, on the table uh, about how to tweet, how to uh, think about blogging, when you should be talking to people like me who do the public relations for the university on research, and I hope you'll all take those. We'll also make sure they're available online as well. Great. Any concluding thoughts from our... Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I want to thank Austin, Adriana, and Nick for a very engaging presentation. <laughs>